Ladies and gentlemen, this is your reaction. This is History of Russia Part Three by the channel Epic History TV. Yes, Part Two. We saw Peter the Great, uh, the guy basically who created Saint Petersburg and did many reforms to, I guess, improves the entire empire for a long, long time. Now we're going to see, I guess, Catherine the Great. I related to Catherine the Great series by extra credits. Uh, in that, obviously, I learned about her and how you know great as an emperor she was. Obviously, you know her husband, right, Peter the Third. Was a moron, as we learned in that series. Uh, you know, Catherine didn't have to do much to, you know, I guess overthrow him because he he was like I said, a moron. He didn't do anything. Yeah, he could have, you know, caused so many hurdles along the way to stop her from becoming an emp empress, and he didn't. So we're gonna see how, uh, if I remember correctly, Catherine how she's gonna expand, uh, you know, her territory through Ottomans, and I guess gonna consume Poland too, including other Europeans' power too. Right? Poland is gonna disappear here. I don't know. I'm pretty sure that's the case. Yeah, so it's gonna be fun. Remember, people, if you like my reaction, if you like subscribe, check out the reaction. There's a link in the description. Check out the cast of plays like history, internet historian, cross country national, CGB Gray. Yeah, let's watch it. In the early 1700s. Peter the Great's reforms put Russia on the path to becoming a great European power. But it was his grandson's German wife, Catherine, who deposed her husband to become Empress of Russia, who oversaw the completion of that transformation. Like Peter, she too would be remembered as the Great. She also admired Peter the Great, right? If I remember correctly. Catherine was a student and admirer of the French Enlightenment, and even corresponded with the French philosopher Voltaire. She reigned as an enlightened autocrat. Her power was unchecked, but she pursued ideals of reason, tolerance, and progress. Catherine became a Wait a minute, she was German or Austrian? I think she was German, right? She was German and, you know, as a, as a kid, read a lot, lots of books and things. Great patron of the arts and learning. Schools and colleges were built. The Bolshoi Theatre was founded, as well as the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts. While her own magnificent collection of artwork now forms the basis of the world-famous Hermitage Museum. Damn, okay. Catherine encouraged Europeans to move to Russia to share their expertise and helped German migrants to settle in the Volga region, where they became known as Volga Germans. Their communities survived nearly 200 years until, on Stalin's orders, they were deported east at the start of World War II. Of course, Stalin. Catherine's reign also saw enormous territorial expansion. In the south, Russia defeated the Ottoman Empire, winning new lands and the fortresses of Azov and Kerch. But then Catherine faced a major peasant revolt, led by the renegade Cossack Yemelian Pugachev. The rebels took many fortresses and towns and stormed the city of Kazan before they were finally defeated by the Russian army. Catherine then forcibly incorporated the Zaporozhian Cossacks into the Russian Empire and annexed the Crimean Khanate, a thorn in Russia's side for 300 years. Russia's new lands in the south were named Novorossiya, New Russia. Sparsely populated, they were settled by Russian colonists under the supervision of Prince Potemkin, Catherine's advisor and lover. the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, exhausted by war and at the mercy of its neighbours, was carved up in a series of partitions, there with go. Russia taking the lion's share. Poland did not re-emerge as an independent nation until 1918. <laughs> yes, easily. Russia inherited a large Jewish population from Poland, who Catherine decreed could live only in the so-called Pale of Settlement were excluded from most cities. Okay. In France, the French Revolution led to the execution of King Louis XVI. 
Catherine was horrified, and in the last years of her reign, completely turned her back on the liberal idealism of her youth. Seriously. I mean, she just went against everything she stood for before. But yeah, it makes sense because of French Revolution, right? French Revolution happened and every other European monarchy like, oh, hell no, France just did that. Now everybody was scared. Like, okay, we could be next. Because, you know, anybody just need one thing, right? Other countries can look at France like, why can't we do that? And another revolution could break out major scale in any time. Right, so she just went all paranoid, gave up all the ideas that she was holding, right? And she just went all paranoid and just, yeah. I mean, I can't blame her, right? Because she's the monarch. Well, Russia's, Russia could basically, you know, doesn't matter how good she rules, people could basically go, we don't need monarch, why can't we like French? Well, let's form a republic. Three years later, Catherine died, ending one of the most glorious reigns in Russian history. She was succeeded by her son, Paul, a man obsessed by military discipline and detail, and opposed to all his mother's works. Russia joined the coalition of European powers, fighting revolutionary France. Marshal Suvorov, one of Russia's greatest military commanders, won a series of victories against the French in northern Italy. But the wider war was a failure. He knows Meanwhile, coming. Paul's reforms had alienated Russia's army and nobility, and he was murdered in a palace coup. Ah. He was succeeded by his 23-year-old son Alexander. Now Napoleon who comes. shared his grandmother Catherine's vision for a more modern Russian state. His advisor, the brilliant Count Mikhail Speransky, reformed administration and finance. Yet the Emperor refused to back his plans for a liberal constitution. Ultimately, it was war with France that would dominate Alexander's reign. Yeah. France had a new Emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte, who inflicted a series of defeats on Russia and her allies. At Austerlitz, Eilau and Friedland. But at Tilsit in 1807, the two young emperors met and made an alliance. Russia attacked Sweden, annexing Finland, which became an autonomous Grand Duchy within the Russian Empire. Oh, yeah. But then, in 18. I just saw the Geography Now video of Finland, in which uh, he talks about that, right? They annex this and also this uh, small area here that belongs to Sweden. In 12, Napoleon invaded Russia. At Borodino, French and Russian armies clashed in a gigantic battle. Oh, one of the bloodiest of the age. Napoleon emerged victorious, but the Russian army escaped intact. Napoleon occupied Moscow, which was destroyed by fire. And when Alexander refused to negotiate, the French army was forced to make a long retreat through the Russian wind. I'm not gonna lie, uh, you know, Alexander the First, right? He did, uh, he was pretty significant in a way because he did something that most people wouldn't, right? He's, you know, he stuck to his, uh, you know, I guess his tactics. He didn't give up, give up to, I guess, Napoleon. Napoleon took over Moscow. Any other uh, leader of time would be like, okay, I guess I have to, you know, talk peace treaty or something, right? I have to give up in certain way. No, he just ran away, right? He just ran away. He didn't give up, which was pretty significant because this is the point when Napoleon started to lose. And in the end, Napoleon will lose because of this. So this is pretty significant decisions by Alexander I. I don't think he gets much credit for it. It's just, yeah, Alexander I, he was a guy, uh, basically a czar of Russia or something during the Napoleonic times. No, because of him, Napoleon started to lose. Because if he had give up like Napoleon wanted him to do uh, around Moscow, the winter wouldn't, wouldn't have been such a problem for Napoleon. But he didn't give up. And as soon as the winter came, Napoleon started to run because he wasn't prepared for that. And basically, Alexander chased him down all the way to France. And after that, it's all downhill for Napoleon. Winter was annihilated. 
Napoleon had been dealt a mortal blow. Yeah, seriously, out of half a million soldiers, only 30, 40,000 survived. And Russia, alongside Prussia, Austria, and Britain, then led the fight back, which ended in the capture of Paris mm. and Napoleon's abdication. At the Congress of Vienna, as part of the spoils of war, Alexander became King of Poland. Then, with Austria and Prussia, he formed the Holy Alliance, with the aim of preventing further revolutions in Europe. Meanwhile, in the Balkans and Caucasus, Russia had been waging intermittent wars against the Ottoman Empire, Persia and local tribes. The frontier had been pushed south to incorporate Bessarabia, Circassia, Chechnya, and much of modern Georgia, Dagestan, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. But the peoples of the Caucasus bitterly resisted Russian rule. Russia's attempt to impose its authority on the region led to the Caucasian War, a brutal conflict fought amongst the mountains and forests that would drag on for nearly 50 years. Alexander was succeeded by his brother Nicholas, a conservative and reactionary. But parts of Russian society had now developed an appetite for European-style liberalism, including certain army officers who'd seen other ways of doing things during the Napoleonic Wars. They saw Nicholas as an obstacle. I mean, they had to. They had to adapt because Napoleon was way too hard. At the start, with the, you know, Napoleon versus Russia, Russia got his ass kicked over and over again. So they had to adapt and learn. And in the end, they just knew what to do against Napoleon. And the new emperor's first challenge would be military revolt. Epic History TV relies on the support of its viewers to keep... I guess around this time he didn't do Napoleonic series, right? I think Napoleonic series by Epic History TV is one of the biggest they ever did, right? Or anybody has did. Uh, there, there were so many parts of that, Napoleonic Wars. Hours and hours of parts. I read the whole series, you know, last year. I had to delete most of that videos for, you know, copyright issues, right? Not copyright issues, monetization issues. Because... Uh, YouTube has certain issue with the video, so I had to delete a lot of only last two or three is left, I guess. You know, one of them is also with those Russian campaign, which was a horror show, right? Epic History covered that in detail, which was just fucked up. How Napoleon basically got his ass kicked because Alexander didn't give it up. If he had said, okay, let's sign the peace treaty, all right, I'll give up. The entire world would have been different by now. Because Napoleon's downside started from that, you know, uh, retreat from Moscow. Well, people, that was History of Russia Part 3 by the channel Epic History TV. If you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe. Check out the Rick Sanity, there's a link in the description. Check out the cards for playlists like History, Inter Historian, uh, CGP Grey, Kazakhstan, Nutshell, and yeah, I'll see you next time.